but we're just going to do a little 10 minute guided sit to start our time together. You can mute if you want, but I enjoy the sounds of us all being in our spaces. So you can do what seems, what seems right, um, right for you. So let's begin by just having this sense of groundedness wherever we are. And just coming into the body, Mark used to say, greet the body as you'd greet an old friend. So we can just really inhabit where we are, who we are, bringing our whole selves into our practice, not leaving anything out. We are completely welcome. And we can just engage with whatever practice best supports our stability, our calmness, our ability just to be here. And it might be the breath, it might be hearing, whole body awareness. I often begin a practice by noting accepting on the in-breath and letting go on the out-breath. And I find that really helps stabilize my mind. And you might often also have a sense of appreciation for your following through on your intention to be here tonight.
And then for the last minute or two, see if you can connect with your deep aspiration for this investigation of the paramis. Really bringing to mind your intention, your aspiration. The purpose that you have for yourself. and appreciate that aspiration as something that not only will benefit yourself, but is of great benefit to others. So the second of the paramis, and sometimes they're thought of as developmental, a building on one another, although I'm, I'm not as convinced that they have to be, but this is the, the traditional way of presenting them, is in Pali, it's sila, and it is translated as morality or virtue, um, I've always thought in my own mind it's integrity, but then recently I was reading um, an author who said integrity is when you have all the paramis uh, act, then you, you act with complete integrity. But uh, it's also the parami that focuses most clearly on non-harming. And you now there is inevitable pain in life, and this is the parami that is an, um, an aspiration not to add to the suffering for ourselves or for others. And it's the quality of the heart that specifically <coughs> invites us to look at the harm that's caused by speech and by action. And excuse me a minute. And the most common framework for talking about non harming is using the scaffolding of the five training precepts. And those are the training to refrain from killing or harming, the uh, training to refrain from taking that which is not freely given. Sometimes the, the, it, the first one said, no, not to kill, not to steal. But a more nuanced understanding of that second training is a training not to take anything that is not freely given. Which, of course, for I think all of us is, you know, all of us are I think, I don't know if anyone is a native person in this group, but for those of us who are not indigenous people, you know, all of us are living on, uh, on land that was not freely given. Uh, so, you know, working, working with that. And here in, in the Seward neighborhood, you know, the land that common ground is on, I live very close to common ground. Now this area, was used for hunting and for sugaring, but because it was so um, spiritually charged with the Bedote at the confluence of the Mississippi and the um, 
and the, what's now the Minnesota River and with the, the springs and with the waterfall, now, that this was really considered very, very spiritually charged land and people actually didn't live here. They lived on the um, eastern um, shore of uh, Bede Makaska, uh, formerly known as, as Lake Calhoun. But I always, you know, it just really brings me up short that I'm living on land that was considered very sacred land. And it's just uh, something that I really carry in, in my heart that was not freely, not freely given. Uh, the third uh, training is to refrain from sexual misconduct. And sometimes that's also talked about as the misuse of sexual energies. Um, in my own mind, I think about it as also training about not exploiting on the basis of gender. Um, the fourth is to re refrain from false or harmful speech. And the fifth, which is a precept to help you keep the precepts, is the training to refrain from consuming entities that cloud the mind and lead to carelessness. And this is usually talked about in terms of intoxicants like alcohol and drugs. But the Buddha actually in the suttas talked about, for example, people being intoxicated with health. They're, so in, they're healthy now and they're just intoxicated with it. So when the Buddha used that word, it was not just about um, alcohol and drugs, but it's about states of mind that lead to carelessness. And carelessness in both senses of not caring and also being careless in, um, in our, um, you know, not being careful. So that, that fifth precept is something that is a support for the other precepts. And they're all aspirations and they're all um, practices. They're, they're um, ideals that we can have for ourselves uh, that are um, helping us to become more skillful in embodying them. And uh, one of the things I did in my uh, previous working life was I worked as a public health educator. I worked for the Minnesota AIDS Project, and I was an HIV AIDS educator for many years, did some of that in prisons. And I also worked in um, client services as a care linkage specialist. And one of the things I love about the agency I worked for and the kind of public health we did is that we were all um, committed to a principle of harm reduction, which is very pragmatic. And I think that this notion of harm reduction is something I've carried over into my uh, Dharma life. It is working with people, working with yourself from where you are, beginning with where you are and what is feasible or with others about where they are and what is feasible for people to, uh, to do to reduce their risk, to reduce their harm. So it's not an absolute, um, you know, never kill a mosquito, never kill a tick, Although, no, on retreat, and for many of us in our, our lives, we do catch and release of some of the, uh, the creatures in, in our lives. But it, it is really about looking at harm and seeing if we can not eliminate the harm we do, because we all inevitably harm each other in, in all kinds of, of ways. I mean, I think one way that I am constantly catching myself is I forget to ask people what their pronouns are and to be scrupulous about them. And I don't mean that as, I don't mean to harm people, but I know for some people it is really hurtful if I don't ask pronouns and I'm not really careful about them. So 
you know, it's, um, we all, we all harm each other. So, but we do what we can. So we try to find ways in which we can act um, to reduce harm and it's harm to ourselves too. I think we, we, we sort of think it, it, that non-harming is always, you know, we think about others, but we really need to think about harming, non-harming to ourselves. Um, and I think it's been interesting in this uh, time of pandemic to really see how some of these precepts can be uh, applied to some of the ways that we interact and some of the ways that we make decisions. I mean, for example, the one about uh, th this initial one about um, not harming ourselves or others. I mean, things like social distancing, hand washing, wearing masks, um, doing all the sorts of things that we can do to avoid becoming infected ourselves or, um, or infecting others. And I think that it's also um, by being really scrupulous and really careful, we encourage others to feel safe around us. When we're really scrupulous, if we're interacting with um, someone on, um, you know, who is an essential worker, uh, to really let that person know, we answer the door, we put a mask on when we answer the door, to let that person know that we're concerned about their safety too. So there are ways that we can, um, you know, sort of support each other in our efforts to, to not be harming. And um, I know that there are lots of people who say, you know, it doesn't matter if you're far apart, if you, you know, aren't wearing a mask. And I personally think it's, it's a wonderful uh, visual sign that I care about you I want you to be safe. I want myself to be safe. So we can think about how we might want to, to do that. Um, refrain from taking that which is not freely given. Um, I think we're sort of beyond the toilet paper hoarding. But um, one of the things that I've thought about, my, my brother actually works at a, a Menards and he said he has no choice. He has to go in, he has to go to work. And he said, uh, that so many people come in and he said they decide, you know, okay, so I'm at home. This is the, the time I'm going to, you know, build a skate park for my kid in the yard. And he said, I wish that people were only buying essential things from essential workers. That I wish people cared enough about my health that they would only come in the store when they really needed something. And I think that's... Um, now, again, that, that when we are um, you know, sort of, it's, it's made me really think about, you know, sort of ordering stuff online. I think, okay, so that's an essential worker who has to come to, to my house. And uh, you know, I want to be mindful about how much I put people in harm's way. And it's, it's just a different arena for us to, uh, to consider. And there's been, you know, just a ton of online shopping because a lot of times people are bored and that's what, um, what they do. So really being, being mindful about taking what's uh, only what's freely given, or we might want to think about, you know, how we respect the, um, the labor of others who don't have a choice about going to work. And feel free, <clears throat> feel free to unmute yourself and jump in if you want to comment on, on any of these as we're, we're going uh, along. The third training is to refrain from um, sexual misconduct or the misuse of sexual energies. Um, 
I think it includes not exploiting gender inequalities. Um, but observing this, this precept really leads to trust. This is a, a precept where, um, you know, when we refrain from, from this sort of misuse, people feel safe around us. And that is a great gift to be able to let people know that we are, we are safe to be around. And so that's something to, uh, I don't know if there's any particular uh, application in the pandemic, except that, you know, we are living with our, our partners and our friends and maybe to just really um, investigate again, um, trust and the generosity of, of trust. Um, and I don't think I have much more to, to say about, about that. Um, I think that in the, the wider world, we see so much about the misuse of sexual energy and exploitation. But, you know, for each of us, it may play out in a different way in our, our circumstances. The fourth one is one that, you know, many of us could spend a lifetime on about refraining from uh, false and harmful speech. And I think of this also as inflammatory speech. And to think about what we are um, whether it's in our conversations with people or whether it's when we get on, on the internet. Speech that, that simply inflames and agitates, although sometimes it gives us a sense of righteousness or a sense of being um, uh, in comradeship with people. A lot of what, especially in, in this time, what I see on Facebook and on um, in some other, other venues is um, speech that just leads to more aversion or speech that is, um, makes people feel more frightened, more insecure, so if we can find things that are um, ways in which we support each other, um, ways in which we notice what is, what is good, what is supportive, um, and as we work with each other in our uh, families or our social circles to try to um, have speech that gives people hope or gives people confidence that doesn't undermine them. That's a great area for, for training. And finally, the last one, uh, refraining from consuming entities that cloud the mind and lead to carelessness. Um, now, I, I just find this a great place to um, investigate um, you know what I what I do what television I consume and um, you know I probably am consuming more more television than um, than I would like um, you know I uh, it's something that I do with my family at night and but what I notice is when I wake up in the morning what I'm thinking about is a plot of city homicide. So, um, you know, it's, uh, and I will confess here that I have a, I watch murder mysteries that are set in exotic places, you know, Tasmania, that's you now in Finland, and it's sort of my, um, uh, love of travel that I, I you know, watch these uh, with characters that I think are really interesting. 
So, but, and I think it, it's a pretty harmless um, thing to do. But I do notice that when I wake up in the morning, I'm still thinking about that. And so it's just an area that I think I could probably practice a little more restraint. On the other hand, I'd like to do something with my family in the evening. So it's, it's just an area to um, investigate. Um, you know, we can approach the precepts um, really as matters of, of caring for ourselves and as observing what happens. You know, they're great areas for practice. Like what if we have an intention to work with, with a precept in a certain sort of way and we find ourselves just um, feeling defeated um, of, you know, people talk about, you know, what do they do when they have, they've taken a, a, have an aspiration not to kill and then they have termites in the house. And you know, one of the, the interesting reflections about the precepts is that it is always better to be aware that you are um, not able to act in accordance with your aspiration than to be oblivious to it. That there is real, it's the seed of wisdom when you see that. Uh, oh, this was unskillful. And you say something and you just are living with the, the unpleasant taste of what it was that you said. And that is really a seed of wisdom. So it's, a, uh, it's, it's really helpful. Um, we could also look at, so what were the causes that precipitated our acting unskillfully. Um, and one of the things is that it's often when we are tired, when we're feeling overwhelmed, that those are the times that we act most skillfully. When we're able to be mindful, when we have uh, some time to sort of compose ourselves in responding to someone else, we're often able to act more skillfully. So it's really worthwhile to, um, to note uh, when it is, you know, what the, the conditions are that undermine your intention. Um, I knew a, a therapist once who said she told couples that were having any sorts of stresses that they couldn't talk to each other after about 10 o'clock at night, that they just, just need to stop talking because the more tired they were, the more likely they were to engage in uh, conversations that were just not gonna be helpful in the, in the long run. So it's really important to also just bring our mindfulness and understand, okay, so what were the circumstances in which I was not able to be in alignment with my um, aspirations? So, you know, what we can investigate this week are the ways that we can practice non-harming in our situations, whether we're working from home or doing essential work in the community, um, whether we're taking care of kids, living in isolation, um, and um, what are the what are the the sort of practices that will will support that? Uh, what would we like to do differently? because our lives right now are really about finding skillful means to avoid harming ourselves and others. And it comes back to our, our mindfulness and our uh, very basic um, you know, aspiration to live with kindness and compassion. And that includes compassion for ourselves. So I hope that that's a, um, there's a lot, a lot in there and it may sound very um, overwhelming, but you could just choose one, one area that you'd like to be a little more attentive to um, this week about non-harming. And please include not harming yourself. I think that, that we um, tend to sort of gloss over that. But what would be a way that 
that we could be um, really thoughtfully non-harming to ourselves or others. So does anyone want to chime in with this and respond to it or make some suggestions? Thank you so much, Jennifer. That's, that's really one of the kindest things we may do this week is just to investigate, you know, what are the conditions under which I uh, am harmful to myself when I'm not really taking care of myself, when I'm not um, being compassionate to myself and to have um, compassion around that. And it's just bringing that, that mindfulness to it and that kindness to it. And you know, I really believe that often for me, it has really been making that connection between cause and, and effect. Oh, when I do this, this is the consequence and, and I suffer for it. And you know, it's something that, that often, it's, it's not an instant cure. I do it, may, oh, yeah, that's right, I do this, I, this happens and it's really painful and it's really painful. And eventually um, we can see through that and we may be able to work with it in a more, a more skillful way. But the other thing to just really hold in our hearts is this is a really difficult time. And we should all be just holding ourselves with a lot of tenderness and blaming ourselves is always uh, counterproductive. A Dharma teacher once said to me, blaming always leads to suffering. Mm. And I think that that, is, that has been true in my experience. And um, so when we blame ourselves, it's like, you know, putting, I think of it as you know, like a gutter ball in bowling. We start blaming ourselves, there's only one place it's gonna go and that's to more suffering. So if we can, can really um, have some kindness and, and generosity and I mean, you're, what you explained, Jennifer, you know, it, it, this is related to your job. You, you can, there are lots of ways that we talk ourselves into um, doing things that, that on reflection may not have been um, the best choice, the wisest choice, but it's a very human choice. Mm -hmm. I hope you can bring a lot of kindness um, to that. Thank you. Well, thank you for saying that. I mean, I've been a retreat manager and I um, have, have on several occasions, I mean, there are people who tell me what their needs are and we try to accommodate them and I'm often chagrined by not having anticipated and make it easy for someone to get what they need. It is really, um, I think, an area where um, there's a lot more um, just waking up to, for example, disability issues. Um, you know, uh, we've never had um, a sign interpreter at Common Ground. And someone might say, well, there are no deaf people at Common Ground, but there's no interpreter at Common Ground. Um, you know, I mean, things like, like that. And the other part about um, there is, the Buddha said to, uh, when we speak, we should speak in uh, what is true, what is timely, what is um, useful, and you need to do that with a heart that is without malice. So speaking truthfully about um, issues of gender inequality or racism in the in the community and teachers, it's been a very hard thing to do. Um, and people are often um, intimidated, but I think it is a necessary thing to do. And that is right speech. And we certainly know of many scandals in 
numerous Buddhist communities where people knew what was going on, but didn't say anything. And the harm that came out of that was multiplied by not saying anything. So I, I think that right speech is about, you know, there's, there's our motive in doing it too, though. You know, are you saying it with an intention to be, um, tell the truth, to be um, not, not out of a sense of, of harming, but with a good intention? And then for, you know, something that is timely at the right time, and that may mean saying it now instead of waiting. We're holding, holding ourselves in kindness. I see it's seven and we said we'd finish at seven. So may everyone have a good week of caring for yourself, doing the best you can. Uh, thank you so much for coming tonight and participating. And I hope to see you next week. So take care.